Um, I hope I did not forget any children's name. If I have forgotten, have I forgotten Kinsley and, and Easton? Have I? If I have, hey, hello, Kinsley and Easton. Uh, Mr. Benny has a sharp hearing. Uh, I think I would say sharp hearing in the church, but selective hearing at home. So that's, that's a different matter. <laughs> uh, it reminded me, and uh, I want to remember all the children. I think I'll have the list next Sunday, so I won't rely on my own uh, memory, so uh, I wouldn't, wouldn't forget children's name. All right. The title that I gave for today's sermon is The Longest Prayer of Jesus. I have been going through the last few chapters in the Gospel of John, 21 chapters. Each chapter is so important in the Gospel of John, for that matter, every Gospel. But John, in particular, he's writing something to do with theology, deep meaning embedded in each one of those chapters. We looked at chapter 15, uh, you know, I'm the vine, you're the branches, and 16 when the Lord said that I'm going to be gone, I'll be lifted up. And then, of course, we come to 15, now 17, 16, 17. Jesus prayed many prayers during his earthly ministry. If you read all four Gospels, you would come across at least 38 times Jesus said, let me go and pray. Why would he have to pray? He felt that prayer was necessary in order to stay in touch with God and to know God's will and purpose for his life. So he prayed all the time. The disciples did not know how to pray, so they asked the Lord Jesus, Please teach us how to pray. Then the Lord taught the Lord's prayer to the disciples. Every time I do a funeral at the graveside, I would ask people to recite with me the Lord's prayer by heart. It's a shame that many funerals, people don't know that. Only two or three, or some funerals, all of them. And it's so sad that people do not remember even the Lord's Prayer. I wouldn't say the name, but even some pastors standing by me, they fumble. I thought to myself, come on now, this is the Lord's Prayer. Talk to the disciples, we are supposed to know that by heart. It's important to know their prayer. Jesus taught the disciples. But out of all prayers that Jesus prayed, 38 prayers, as I counted them, two were very important prayers Jesus prayed. The first one I would call the high priestly prayer that is found in chapter 17. I'm going to be preaching about that. The second one is not in John's gospel, but in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. If you go to Matthew chapter 26, you would know that prayer. I would call it the high intensity prayer. These two prayers are something that you and I would have to meditate on. The first is high priestly prayer, John chapter 17. Then Matthew 26, also in Luke and Mark. It's called high intensity prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. For some reason, John is not listing that high intensity prayer. Have you wondered why? I wondered. Only Mark, Luke, and Matthew are recording that. But here's the reason why I think John might have omitted that. As you know, that Mark and Luke were not the disciples of the Lord Jesus who wrote the gospel. Now, how in the world they wrote the gospel? Mark what was the companion of Peter. Peter was the eyewitness. So whatever Peter recited to him, Mark wrote that. And Luke was the companion to Paul. So Paul was revealed by God the Holy Spirit, so Luke recorded everything. If you read 2 Peter, Peter is writing, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, that all of these people wrote the gospel, got the inspiration of God the Holy Spirit to write. Let me read that. We need to know... Whether or not they are disciples, it is still God's word. 
Second Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21, knowing this first, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So, there it is. God the Holy Spirit inspired the gospel writers to write. Now, the second question I had, where do you think God prayed these two prayers, the high priestly prayer and the high intensity prayer? Some commentators believe that God prayed both prayers in the Garden of Gethsemane. I, for one, don't believe that God prayed both prayers in the Garden. Here's the reason. He was walking from the upper room through the temple and we meditated what happened when he was standing outside the door of Jerusalem temple when he found the, the grapevine in gold uh, was used as a decoration over the door and then he looked at that and said, I am the true vine. That was on the way. And then when you come to chapter 17, it says that when they crossed a brook or a waterway, Jesus began to pray this prayer. And there's another reason why I think God did not pray in the Garden of Gethsemane, because he was just crossing. If you go there, the temple and the little creek, and then you go up the mountain to the Garden of Gethsemane. So Jesus was probably talking and said, wait here, as soon as he crossed into Kidron Valley, he prayed their prayer. Another strong reason why I believe Jesus did not pray this prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane before the high-intensity prayer is that when God prayed that high-intensity prayer, the disciples were sleeping. Remember, he came out three times, wake them up. But in this prayer, you don't see Jesus waking them up. He was praying a long prayer. The high priestly prayer. Prayer. Now, why do we call this high priestly prayer? It is not in the Bible. The Bible does not call this high priestly prayer. But the theologians, pastors like me, we always call that the high priestly prayer. Going back to the book of Exodus, God gave this command to Moses to be transmitted to the family of Aaron the descendants of Aaron should become priests, and then there should be one high priest who would go into the Holy of Holies at the tabernacle once a year to offer sacrifice for the sins of their people, the Day of Atonement. So it was an intercessory prayer, praying for the atonement of the people of Israel. This is exactly what Jesus did when he prayed this prayer, prayer of atonement. So we call it the high priestly prayer. And he was interceding for three different kinds of people. One for himself. I could preach a whole sermon on that one thing. God prayed for himself. Why Jesus had to pray for himself? There are so many reasons why he prayed for himself. That's for another day. The second part is what I'm going to preach about is that God prayed for his disciples. I can equate that to Christians, believers like you and me. He prayed for his disciples, believers. I would compare disciples to Christians because in the place called Antioch, for the first time, disciples were called Christians in the book of Acts. Therefore, you and I are disciples of the Lord Jesus in that respect. And then the third part of the prayer that Jesus offered was this. He prayed for the church as a whole, for the people. I'm not going to preach about that as well. I could preach a whole sermon on that. But I'm going to preach on the second part of that prayer. Jesus prayed for his disciples. Now when I began to, to read in the scripture, chapter 17, I broke that into three different parts that would help us today as believers. Turn with me to Gospel of John, chapter 17. 
The first thing I read there is that Jesus prayed for unity and joy. In your notes, Jesus prayed for unity and joy. John 17, 10 through 13. Let me read that to you. All mine are yours, all yours are mine, and I'm glorified in them. And I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world. Talking about the disciples, we Christians. And I'm coming to you. Talking about his crucifixion and ascension. I'm coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, meaning Judas. He was already lost, <laughs> and God scored that, lost. There's no redemption for him at the time. Never again, because he was not redeemed. And these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in them. The initial part of this prayer, specifically written to disciples, to you and me, therefore, everything he said here applies to us. It's interesting that he described the Trinity in the first part. He said, glorify your son, that son may glorify you, father and son. I glorified you on earth, have accomplished the work that you gave me. Father and Son, yours they are. They, you gave them to me. I kept them. They kept your word except one. All are mine and yours are mine. I'm glorified in them. While I was with them, I kept them in your name. All about Trinity. God, the Father, and me. We are one. John state earlier in John's gospel, many times Father and I are one. It's a similar language he's using here. And then he's praying for our oneness first, then joy. He said, I want them to be one, unified. Then my joy may be their joy. A little contradicting. It may seem that way, because when you read in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3, Isaiah 53, verse 3, Jesus was quoted there as a man of sorrow acquainted with grief. Now, how can a man of sorrow acquainted with grief can be joyful? It's not contradictory. It is how Jesus overcame his sorrow and his grief. I'll talk about that. So in one word, unity can be described this way on the PowerPoint. Unity with God and with one another is the secret of joy in a Christian's life despite external events. I put that quote. God gave it to me. It's because... Whatever happens, you could have sorrow, you could have grief. As Jesus himself was called a man of sorrow and grief, can have joy because he had unity with the Father. And also unity with one another. Even though Judas Iscariot betrayed the Lord Jesus, he still had unity with him. He only felt sorry for him. So that's how... God was praying for that unity and asking God to give unity to his disciples. Because the disciples will have sorrowful time. They will have grief. They will have troublesome time. They will have times when people would hate them. They would have times they'll be stoned. They'll have time they will be persecuted mentally and physically. God prayed, I want you to keep them unified and give them joy. Now, I'm going to break that down, joy. His joy 
The joy that Jesus had was rooted in the unbroken fellowship with God, his Father. Now, our joy should be rooted in God. Then we can face the circumstances, anything that comes along the way in our life. Now, how can we have that joy? Two different ways. In His Word and in prayer. I'll give you a simple example that might help you all. Well, on my mission trip, every morning, when I get up in my hotel room, I bring up my YouTube and play a song. We thank thee each morning. Jim Reeves sang that years ago. Why are we thankful to the Lord every morning, religiously I prayed, and, and then open my windows and see the sun coming up and pray, then go for breakfast at 7.30 every morning. And then every night, with tears, I would go to the Lord in prayer before going to bed. I do. I did. Every day, religiously, because of what I saw and the burden that I had. Now, I'm not able to do that every day here as soon as I came back. Why wasn't I able to do? Busy. Busyness can rob you of your time with God and the cares of your family and you and the ministry or anything can weigh you down. I was convicted. Put the sermon down. I don't want my joy to be robbed because of, even though I'm doing ministry, from God's Word and prayer. Your job, your family, and your, your, your selfishness can rob you of the time that you can have with God. The joy should be rooted in the unbroken fellowship. How can you keep that fellowship intact? By the word and by your prayer. His joy, secondly, was the fruit of the true faith and confidence in his Father. True faith and confidence. If you ask Christian, do you have faith? Yes, I do. Most of the Christians, if not all of them, would answer you. I have faith. But if I ask the second question, do you have confidence in your faith? It's totally two different things. Having faith in God is one. Having confidence in your faith is totally different. And they may kind of stutter. Mm, yeah, I do, then I don't. Why? Why do we lose confidence on God? Because there are many confidence killers. That's why Jesus prayed, Lord, I want them to have joy. I don't want the devil to rob the joy from my people. And I don't have that in your notes, but I'm going to give that to you. And probably on the PowerPoint here, I will tell you this. There are some joy killers. First thing is circumstances. We think of our circumstances many times. It'll kill your joy. Our circumstances do change. Don't give in to that. Secondly, money. We think more money will bring confidence. We pursue after money, don't we, all the time? Paul said, I've learned to be content in everything. When I have plenty, I'm content. When I have nothing, I'm content. I've learned from Paul in my own life. Don't rely on that mammon. It's a joy killer. Thirdly, achievements. See, goals that you put in your life, even the missions I'm involved in and all the things that we have accomplished, none of them would give you true joy. You'll enjoy it. It's a blessing. But if you rely on your achievements, whether it's the ministry or your personal life and your job, your family, none of them is going to give you a lasting joy. It would help you but won't give you. Sometimes it could become a joy killer. Because when you, when you do something, like Nebuchadnezzar, when he said, look at the great garden that I have built. I have. God struck him down. Could be a joy killer. People could be joy killers. You know, why I say that people... We deal with people every day. 
Shelly deals with people every day. She comes home beaten down every day. People can put you down. People can challenge you. If you're dealing with people on a daily basis, they can rob the joy. It's a joy killer. Pleasure is a joy killer. When you find pleasure, anything other than the Word of God and in prayer, it's going to kill your joy. In Ecclesiastes, King Solomon tried to find joy in everything, with women, with laughter, with money, with wisdom, everything he asked for. I can't say he asked for, he sought after, he got it. Nothing gave him joy. So Jesus was praying, Lord, I want you to give my people my joy that I had despite external circumstances. Number three, his joy came from seeing, next bullet point, not number three, came from seeing the great things God had done. Great things God had done. Look back in your life. When I put this point down, I look back. Many years of my ministry. Remember how God guided each step of the way. It's amazing. Ups and downs. Peaks and valleys. Mr. Jim preached about that in my absence. About peaks and valleys. Mountains and valleys. God guided you. Provided people. Always think of the great things God has done then your joy would be intact. Finally, his joy was never diminished by deception. Jesus never put stocks on people, his own disciples, because one denied and one betrayed. Everybody else ran away except John the Beloved at the cross. And if he stacked his joy on these guys, you lost the joy. Say, I ain't going to. I know people would let you down. I know people would, would persecute you mentally and physically. The circumstances would try to rob the joy that you have in the Lord. Don't let that happen. Jesus never let that happen. He said, no, my joy comes from God. None of the external circumstances, even people, can rob it away from me. That's why you pray, Lord... I want them to be one. Let them have the joy that I have. Secondly, Jesus prayed to protect us from the evil one called the devil. John 17, 15. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Why did Jesus pray, don't take them out of the world? As though that Father is going to take them out of the world. As soon as they are born, no. Here's the reason why Jesus prayed. There are times we become so discouraged and we say, what's the use of me living? Well, you, you may not say that, but you may behave that way. And I could list so many people in the Bible, at least four I want to list before you. There were some in the Bible, prayed, Lord, take me. Job was the first one that comes to my mind. Because of the intensity of devil's attack. He said, take me. Jesus was implying there will be time Christians will be intensely attacked by the devil. Yes, our nation is intensely now being attacked by the devil. Last night before going to bed, I was listening to a song that really brought tears in my eyes. It was the Ukrainian choir singing in English and the Ukrainian language, their symphony choir, Precious Lord, take my hand and lead me home. When you listen to this song and see what the carnage, it'll bring tears in your eyes. You know, that, that song brought me to my knees, at least in my bed I was praying, Lord. And I prayed that none of the devil's intense attack on me or my family or on the church or anybody's family would make us feel, Lord, take us home. Jesus prayed, no, 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 don't take them home, but keep them out of this devil. He's the one attacking. Secondly, Moses. Moses was dealing with forces externally and internally. 
Externally, the forces of Pharaoh attacking him. Internally, his own people, his own family attacking him. We never know how the devil would come. Devil would come through the closest one you have in your life. It could be through your spouse. It could be through your relatives. It could be through your family, your community. Devil comes through those people trying to rob you and joy and attack you. Jesus prayed, keep the devil away. Elijah said, take me. I think God said, don't take him, but keep him away from the devil. Elijah prayed, there's somebody pursuing me to kill me, scaring me. There will be circumstances that you cannot handle physically. Just like Elijah, you would shout out to God saying, this is beyond me. I cannot handle it. Jesus would say, I prayed for you. That God would keep devil out of you. Jonah. Oh, this is interesting. Jonah prayed because of his own disobedience. And because of his own anger. Sometime, because of our own anger and disobedience, we might think, ah, I don't want to live anymore. God would say, no, 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 keep him, keep her down there. But keep that person out of devil's reach. You know, devil attacks Christians through where we are vulnerable. I know I'm taking a little more time. Please bear with me. I want to finish this. It's beautiful, beautiful prayer that God prayed. There are times in our life when we are vulnerable, He will come there. Remember 40 days of fasting that Jesus underwent in the wilderness? Right after that, the devil came to Him and said, first thing, turn these stones into bread and eat. He knew Jesus was hungry. Second, He was so weak, and He said, come to the pinnacle, jump, Angels would carry you. The third thing, he knew that God the Father looked down upon Jesus when he was baptized. This is my beloved Son, upon whom I am well pleased. The devil heard that. Now he's implying to Jesus 40 days when you're suffering. Your Father wasn't there. He's gone. You see how the devil attacked? He says, these are your vulnerable points. You're hungry, you're weak, and now you're forgotten by your father. Therefore, worship me. That's why Jesus prayed. He went through in his own life. Keep my people away from this evil one devil. There are some attacking points in our lives. Let me list them quickly. There are unmet needs in our lives. Devil would come and attack. If there are needs in your life that are not met, devil would come saying that, I'm going to supply you, just like how he tempted the Lord Jesus. I know there are some unmet needs. You're hungry now. I'll supply you. Listen to me. There, there are some unmet needs. I'll supply you. Jump. There are some unmet needs. Your father, it seemed that he's not answering your prayer. You've been praying for a long time. Come to me. I'll give you. Don't listen to him. Secondly, bad moods. Are you listening? Ephesians 4, 28, 26, and 27. Ephesians 4, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And then here it is, very beautiful. And give no opportunity to the devil. When you're angry, you're giving room to the devil, regardless of what you're angry, angry about. He can come, because it's a vulnerable point. And compromising with the world. I'm talking to my own country here. United States of America. You are compromising. If you're compromising with the world, the devil is attacking you. That's an open door for him to take a foothold. That's what is happening in our country. Here it is. Let me read that to you. Be careful to do what the Lord your God has commanded you. Do not turn aside to the right or to the left. Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 32. Deuteronomy 5.32, Jesus told His people, I don't want you to turn to the right or left. Just focus on God. Don't compromise. In Psalmist David 119.3, he's writing, Joyful are those who do not compromise with evil. When you compromise with the world, you open the door for Him. Next one, when you're hurting. If you're discouraged, it will lure you to quick fixes. This is how you're going to fix it. I'll show you the way. When you're down in your spirit, he's going to come. Take advantage of that. And then finally, when you're physically tired. 
You know, when you're physically tired, your mind is confused. The devil would come and confuse you further. If you're weary, it will wear you down. If you get testy by the people, he will push you to the limits. He would test your limits. That's the devil. So I gave you all the reasons. Jesus prayed, Lord, I want this guy, devil, to be away from my people. I know we'll have unmet needs. We'll have bad moods every now and then. We'll compromise with the world. At least we seem to be. And we sometimes we get hurt physically, emotionally, relationally. When we are physically hurt, he is looking there, lurking in the darkness and trying to get in. Jesus prayed, don't let him in. And finally, Jesus prayed for the sanctification of the believers. Chapter 17, verse 17 through 19. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me in the world, I have sent them in the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also be, may be sanctified in truth. The word sanctification. Jesus prayed, I want you to sanctify my people, Christians. Like I said, the word means holy. It means anointed. It means you're being separated from God. It also means saint. Now, how can we be separated? I'm going to tell this and close. There is a process, three-step process for Christians. I put that all in your notes. The first thing is we are being justified. Now, that's the act of God. That act of God is triggered by our obedience to God. We obey. Lord, I'm a sinner. I repent. Then we are justified. And God would justify us as if we have not sinned because He crucified every sin of ours. Hours. That is being justified. And the second step, the first thing is the act of God triggered by our obedience. The second thing is completely act of man with God. Sanctification is our act, which means, Lord, I want you to put me through the process that I would be set apart by you. How can we be set apart by God? Because we are progressively, experientially, Going through the sanctification every day. Lord, clean me every day. Through the knowledge of your word, clean me every day. Obedience to God and he will cleanse us. That's my way of asking God, purify me. Sanctification begins with our effort. Justification begins with God because he died for us. Thirdly, glorification. Oh, my fellow Christians and others... Listening, I'm looking forward to that day. We all will be glorified in the presence of God, the final removal of sin nature from us. That's going to be the completion of our justification and sanctification. In closing, I want to kind of capture what Jesus prayed for his people. Lord, I want them to have the joy regardless of what they face. Lord, I want to keep them away from the attacks of the devil. Be careful of some of the loopholes you have in your life. Don't let the devil in. And the Lord, I want to glorify them, present them faultless before your throne one day. And I pray that God would present us faultless before the throne. In closing, do you have the joy of the Lord today as Jesus prayed? If you don't, please check yourselves. And see whether you gave in to some of the devil's trick. Never give devil a foothold. Devil cannot, cannot push his way into your life and my life. He cannot unless we give him room. Thirdly, are you forgiven and set apart for the Lord Jesus? Let's bow our head and pray together. Dear Lord, be included. We all have the tendency to open the door for the devil to get in. Because we're human beings. As I made the confession myself that the busyness of ministry and life robbed me of my time with you. I don't want 
that to happen anymore. Father, there are unmet needs in our lives. There are so many physical impediments and psychological hurts. I pray, Father, that you would help us to conquer all that. Thank you for this time of worship. If there are people listening to me don't know that Jesus justified on the cross, and I pray they would find the justification for their sins. They would come to know the Lord Jesus. They're Christians in the process of being sanctified, but they have pitfalls. I pray they would bring them, that you would bring them to repentance. Oh Lord, we all look forward to that day we be glorified in the presence of God. Pray that you would talk to us. Now send us with the joy of the Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for indulging another 10 minutes. But I know God blessed his word. Those of you listening, thank you for listening. Those who would like to come this evening, please do come. May God bless you. Let his face shine upon you. Give you peace and joy. Bye-bye.